April 6th. Let's kick off with Robin Mills, CEO of Camar Energy. Robin, we've had a sort of 4% bounce up day uh, after the OPEC decision on Thursday. And then um, yesterday we had a 4% down day. And this morning we're trading a little bit up. Uh, this is a market that seems a little confused by the decisions made by OPEC Plus last week. Yes, that's right, Sean. And I thought it was you know, funny when the OPEC meeting uh, decision was announced, the uh, expectation obviously had been for a rollover of, of the cuts. In fact, OPEC came with a plan for uh, phasing out part of the cuts, um, quite a bit more aggressive than, than most people expected, and yet all prices went up. Uh, and then, as you say, um, they then fell, fell sharply as, as the market seemed to think harder about this and they go, actually, that's quite a lot of oil coming back. Um, plus the, uh, the potential for Iranian supplies as well. And then uh, it seems so far today, the market again thinking, well, perhaps it's a bit of an overreaction. Demand picture is looking a lot better and, and a bit of a recovery in prices. So, yes, quite conflicting impulses. Robin, your thoughts on the increase last week? I mean, we've talked about this in, in different ways uh, on this show, but in some ways it, it struck me that OPEC plus really didn't have a choice here and that an increase had to come. There's already been overproduction by a number of countries. You're either going to get really radical on, on clamping down or that, or you're going to sort of acknowledge it. I mean, how do you see the forces that guided this decision last week? Well, that's right, Sean. Look, I think it was becoming increasingly inevitable because some important members were pushing for increases. And the, I think OPEC and Saudi Arabia in particular got tired of giving uh, Russia a, a little bit of an increase every time and, and nobody else get, getting anything. Um, that wasn't really sustainable. So this time they've laid out this, this phased sequence of easing, which, which is evenly balanced. So everybody is, is getting the same percentage share, share back ultimately over the next three months. The Saudis themselves will be able to, to ought to be able to cut to cut back on there. They've got this million barrel a day voluntary cut. They they were to eliminate that entirely, uh, so according to the plan. And yeah, you know, and you had the UAE, which of course has been pushing for higher production as well. You have Iraq, which has been over complying, uh, sorry, under complying. And now, um, if the uh, if this this phased relaxation goes ahead, that would bring Iraq back into compliance. Well, you know, we'll see if they stick to it. But at least in theory. Vitaly Yermakov, Senior Research Fellow of the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, sitting in Moscow. What does this oil market look like, Vitaly, do you, from your perspective, uh, Russia's uh, kind of view on this decision? Would they be happy with the increase? Yes, hello, hello, Sean, hello, everyone. Uh, well, we knew it was coming, and... Uh, Oil well, market is getting boring uh, because we sort of we we uh, we know what is going to happen uh, to some extent. I'd, I'd hate to see obviously what you there think will is be surprises, exciting. but generally, generally we, we sort of we we uh, we know where we are and where we are going for the moment. Uh, yeah, Russia, I think, is satisfied. We talked that uh, for Russia, fiscal break even oil prices uh, about forty four dollars this year, and so uh, any price above that, obviously. It's uh, quite beneficial for the Russian budget. Uh, oil, Russian oil companies. Yeah, I think uh, this level of prices is, is quite sufficient for the investments into new oil. So, yeah, I think... I mean, from the point of view of the politics of Russia and its internal dynamics with the Russian oil companies, is there any other option but continue to increase every month uh, for the uh, to keep everybody inside the agreement? Well, uh, the market will have to rebalance. And uh, so long as this is continuing, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a relatively slow process of rebalancing. But for now, I think the rational companies, uh, they don't have any other uh, course but to work with the, with the official uh, state decisions on uh, continuing this cooperation with the NOPEC Plus. Victor Yang, Senior Editor, JLC Network Technology. Uh, welcome back to the table from China. Victor, uh, the, the Chinese now looking at getting back into the buying uh, again after the maintenance season, the, the refinery maintenance season. So China could bring back the, uh, some extra demand uh, in the coming months to support these OPEC increases. What does it look like from China? 
Yes, well, that's quite hopeful. Yes, well, and we had just well look at the some data for the first quarter. Well, say like the sales of infrastructure construction machines and industrial index and service index. Well, and the country's GDP growth could hit ten percent, even higher in the first quarter, based on the well data we had say got now. And this booming well growth, I mean, this accelerating growth will surely drive up well demand further. And another factor is the increase in capacity. Well, well, though the country is now removing some small units, but the capacity is still set to grow further this year. So like we have several units come, new units come coming online this year. And so the uh, consumption and new capacity, well, we surely drive up the demand further. So, yes, sure. We saw the uh, services, the purchasing managers index, the, the, yes. the, what they call the cakes and marks at services purchasing managers index rose to 54.3 uh, yes. with the reporting over, overnight. It looks like there's obviously it continues to be very positive signals of the Chinese economic performance this year. Yes, well, and there is increasing confidence in, in the country's economy as the country well, consolidates its achievements in wireless control. And say like infrastructure construction is booming now. Well, even in Guangzhou, where I am, and say the sales, I mean, the, I, I heard that excavators, well, were sold out in the first two months, well, January and February. And the sales were still quite strong in March. So infrastructure was well, really strong. And so every other index too, so the confidence is now getting higher, even higher than before. Yeah. Robin, the increase last week, or the announcement of, of course, nothing takes place until May. And even then we're talking about relatively moderate increases uh, 350,000 within the OPEC plus group and, and 350,000 uh, with Saudi alone. Um, these are still compared to the numbers that we were previously talking about when this agreement was announced a year ago, we're still way behind the curve. And looking at Q2 and in our digest today, it seems we have these contrasting uh, emergences from the, uh, the COVID pandemic. We've got Goldman Sachs announcing that staff and the UK will be coming back to the office uh, shortly, uh, whereas in Mumbai and in India, we're going into lockdown. This is going to be an inconsistent recovery, and the oil markets will have to digest that. Well, yes, I think it is. I mean, so firstly, on the OPEC side, right? So bringing back, as you say, 350,000, the same from, from Saudi, that's 700,000. That's actually more than we were getting at the start of the year when the plan was to bring back half a million barrels a day each month. Uh, and and that, that had to be halted because of uh, uh, the demand recovery not being as strong as expected. But actually, this is a, now a faster pace of gains, although, of course, from a lower level because of the Saudi voluntary cuts. But actually, if this plan goes ahead from May of the next three months as planned, uh, we would be back to July where OPEC originally intended to be back uh, when, when they started this deal back in May last year. So, you know, you could say, OK, with a lot of bumps along the way, they, they could still possibly be on track. Um, and I think as regards the, um, the, uh, the virus issue, yeah, um, it, it is a very patchy recovery and it, and it is going to be. Um, and I think the big concern now is how, does, how do the new variants and the new surges of cases stack up? We've seen this in India, as you say, uh, we've seen a, a, a serious surge in Brazil. We seem to have multiple repeat infections in Brazil, which is, is quite worrying. We know there's at least three uh, worrying, more infectious new variants going around in different places. Um, and yet we have very good vaccine rollouts now taking place in, in the US, in, uh, in the UK, um, in, in the UAE and some other countries. And, and hopefully those are starting to have an impact on, on, the, on the caseload there, which, which is coming down. So, yeah, very patchy. And I think that's going to continue. When you look at the pace of vaccinations, um, you know, some countries will, will be largely vaccinated within a few months and others, you know, at the current pace, it's going to take 10 years. Um, so it, uh, we, we're going to see a very patchy, uh, let's say, I was going to say post-virus world, but for some countries it will be a post-virus world and some it won't. 
Yeah, and, and I suppose there becomes the navigation on how to deal with that. Vitaly, another story overnight. Uh, I'm not sure if it's big news or not, but I thought it was interesting because it was in the Saudi newspaper and that, and I'm sure in many other newspapers, but that Putin uh, has signed into law, uh, uh, signs a law allowing him to serve as president until 2036. Uh, this is the uh, Duracell battery that keeps on going and going. Ultimately, is that something that makes any head news in Russia? Is that a big deal? Is it a small deal? We're looking from the outside. It sort of seems like business as usual in Putin's Russia. Well, this doesn't come as a bolt from the blue. We knew that uh, this legislation uh, was on the plans and now just signed into law. Uh, uh, well, people tend to interpret it as sort of uh, designed specifically to prolong Putin's political life practically forever. But uh, this was done as uh, the process of amendments into Russia's constitution. So these this, uh, new rules, no, no, more, no more than two consecutive terms uh, would apply to, to any uh, future Russia's president. With regards to uh, Putin, well, he's been associated within Russia with uh, stability, uh, political stability, first of all. Uh, obviously, uh, in terms of international relations, Russia is, is, is now uh, is at odds with uh, the West and uh, there are significant tensions and sanctions. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that this is answering your question that it's it's a big deal in Russia because sort of it's it's uh, it's really uh, continuing the status quo. I mean, it comes in the same week when Navalny in, is going on hunger strike in jail, uh, and I'm just wondering: does that dynamic, the Navalny moment that came a month or so ago <laughs> on his return, that's kind of moved uh, into the background now or th does that continue to present some challenges in the political stability in Russia? Well, Sean, uh, you know, this this Western narrative of Navalny versus Putin, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it might be popular in the West, but uh, it absolutely, uh, it doesn't have any ground in real life or in real politics. Uh, Navalny gambled and lost and uh, he uh, he's in jail. He's now trying to uh, really remind his uh, supporters that uh, he's still around as, as a political figure. But by and large, uh, sort of uh, the, the events of the past few months uh, demonstrated that his social base of support is extremely narrow. And uh, really within Russia, he, he doesn't stand a chance, at, at least in, in, in and any and note, yeah, it, it, it's, it's been around for a while, obviously, but it doesn't seem to be getting to any crescendo. Victor, um, one of the stories that is facing the challenge of OPEC plus, of course, is how many barrels of oil Iran will continue to export. And to a certain extent, that depends on China's appetite for Iranian oil. Is that going to increase, do you think, now that Iran is looking to buy more oil or will it uh, decrease? Uh, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, not long ago, there was some kind of complaints about China buying cheap Iranian gold cargo as well, because, well, it was kind of unfair competition for other players as well. And we have heard about this, well, say, and but it's not sure. Well, it's, it doesn't mean that China will buy more, even if the sanctions are lifted, because if the sanctions are lifted, the price would probably go up. And this would make uh, Iranian cargoes less competitive. So that's one possibility. So, so it, it, it doesn't mean that, that necessarily. And, but it depends on how much oil China would actually need in the future and how competitive Iranian cargoes would be too. Robin, uh, just as a setup for the, the next question, inevitably we are going today into uh, talks between Iran and the uh, the uh, permanent five members of the Security Council and Germany about rehabilitating the JCPOA agreement, nuclear agreement. What are your, of course, America is not in the room for direct talks or they're there in the building, but they're not in the table. 
uh, what is your expectations for the session this week uh, and the rehabilitation of the, this agreement? Yeah, look, I, I don't think we should expect any dramatic breakthroughs. I think it's going to be a tough set of negotiations. Um, and I think both sides, and, and particularly the US side, have been you know, surprisingly kind of hesitant to come back to the, the table, even for these talks. And these are, these are indirect, as you say. Um, and, you know, Biden as a candidate ran on part of his platform was re-entering the JCPOA immediately. He hasn't done that. And there seems to be a strong school of thought in his administration that the US should try and use this leverage that they, uh, that they supposedly inherited from Trump uh, and try and force some concessions elsewhere. And the Iranians have, have strongly resisted that. So I think it's going to be, be a, a tricky set of negotiations. Uh, the, um, of course, the Iranian elections are up, are up fairly soon. And, uh, and then there'll be a, a new team on the other side of the table, probably not particularly uh, uh, friendly and, and constructive one. I think the talks could, could be very difficult. But I think there has been a move recently. To, yes, there will be some. So some uh, there will be some action, um, but it will take a long time. It could probably take the rest of this this year at least before we we get some kind of a JCPOA plus, which uh, which has some more bells and whistles and uh, it may, maybe addresses some areas that the US and the other par partners had about Iran's concerns. But that will mean giving Iran something in, in return as well. And, and I think you know Victor's point on on China's uh, buying of Iranian oil is very interesting. Um, makes a lot of sense, of course, that if the big discounts aren't aren't there anymore then China would, wouldn't have any particular reason to buy more Iranian crude, even post-sanctions. So it'll be key, I think, will, will under these, these talks, will there be some waivers, some interim measures that would allow the Iranians again to sell to South Korea, Japan, uh, India, as it's, they did, I suppose it's, as they it's, did it's, under Obama? It's what's, what's, what's difficult at this moment, Robin, is, is to identify who's really incentivized to resolve this standoff. Who, who, I mean, the Americans seem to be interested, but not committed. I mean, it's hard to see uh, the Chinese. Are they really interested? They're managing to negotiate a new relationship with Iran. Uh, who do you think or where, is, where are the, the winners or the incentives to get this done? Oh, I think there are plenty of overall incentives, right? I mean, the Iranians are under strict sanctions and it is, you know, although the economy... incentive, but... Yeah, I mean, the economy is back to growth this year, but still it's, it's in a bad way. Um, so th there is a reason for them to do that as long as they don't have to give up much, much, if anything, to get back in the JCPOA. And for the U.S. side, the U.S. has got concerns over Russia. They have uh, major concerns over, over China. Iran continues and the whole Middle East continues to be a, a, a distraction. The U.S., uh, you know, the last uh, three presidents have all campaigned on getting out of the Middle East. None of them has been able to. Um, and, and resolving this issue and putting the Iran thing to bed would, would would finally free up the US to focus on, on what really it considers big pictures as more important issues. And if they can come up with a JCPOA plus that addresses some of these other issues and concerns that they have with Iran, I think it's gonna be extremely difficult, close to impossible, but uh, if they could, then that's, that's clearly a, an objective of this administration. Vitaly, the other issue facing the sort of oil markets as a whole, uh, as, as, as OPEC Plus tries to return its barrels to the market, is the return of U.S. shale and other higher cost producers. We have stories on the digest today of uh, oil field services sector in the U.S. adding 23,000 jobs in March, as well as uh, soaring methane emissions in the U.S. oil patch, which would indicate production returning. How likely do you think it is that the U.S. higher cost production shale and others could come back in this window as uh, OPEC plus tries to add barrels back? Oh, well, Sean, I mean, uh, the, the way you put it, uh, that uh, high methane emissions associated with U.S. shale production are returning, that's a scary thought right there. Uh, and uh, that's something the world doesn't need at all. I mean, uh, high methane emissions, because this is really harmful. And uh, in terms of greenhouse gas effects, methane is so much more powerful than CO2. I, mean, uh, I suppose that, the reporting uh, that it's that it there's higher records of it is because methane is associated with shale, uh, and there there is supposedly new rules coming from the Biden administration to shut that down. Mm -hmm. But at this moment in time, those new regulations are not in place. Well, exactly, and uh, that, that's that's uh, I think that's important to put the overall developments uh, in the context of this. 
uh, energy transition agenda <clears throat> because it's not uh, the ultimate goal to produce as much oil as fast as possible. The ultimate goal is to provide uh, the energy to the humankind that is sustainable and uh, to find uh, the, the, the right balance between hydrocarbons and uh, renewable sources of energy. And I think uh, the whole world is now uh, a little bit obsessed with energy transition. I think we've gone a little bit too far. But on the other hand, uh, the examples of this irresponsible behavior when people uh, pollute and emit uh, without any consideration uh, of the long-term consequences is also very dangerous. Is well, it in, I mean, from the politics and the economics of it, I mean, obviously Chevron or Oxy are a profit-making company. They've got to make profit for their shareholders and, and leave the politicians to worry about what the policies are. Ultimately, from a Russia point of view, do you think there are concerns at all in terms of the, the increase opportunity for new supply that OPEC plus wants that opportunity and not to give it away to shale oil or others? Well, first of all, uh, the companies are no longer immune uh, from those political pressures. Uh, it's their shareholders who are demanding that the companies act responsibly. So the money here uh, is, is, is really uh, shouldn't be associated with dirty practices, first of all. Secondly, uh, obviously, uh, everyone was uh, talking about the potential for U.S. shale to swing back. Uh, this happened in, the, in uh, 2016. This happened in 2018. And uh, this time around, obviously, there will be uh, some companies that would put uh, volumes uh, maybe over profitability, but uh, I would guess that uh, to a less extent than before. Uh, it seems the reports are that U.S. producers are now really uh, very concerned about returning to profitability, plus all the pressures associated with uh, financing now uh, being uh, really linked to environmental uh, agenda. They are going to put some um, limits to this unsustainable growth of U.S. shale output. Obviously, uh, sort of the, the fact that prices retreated from $70 level back to uh, $60 level. This is a, this is a reminder that uh, as soon as we see uh, some robust activity in uh, the U.S. shale patch, the, the market is going to react. And uh, so I don't know what level <coughs> is, is, is really uh, sufficient now. Uh, U.S. shale is very sensitive to relatively small uh, incremental price increases. And some operators, uh, they can really produce uh, relatively sustainably at $45 uh, WTI. For some, it's higher. But uh, I think my, my, my main conclusion would be that for the U.S. shale to grow robustly, they would need uh, prices around $70. And uh, I don't think 70 is the sustainable level going forward. It should be less than that. Let's go to the survey question uh, to get a view from the room on the other question we discussed. Will Iran nuclear talks in Vienna this week deliver tangible progress towards rehabilitation uh, of the JCPOA? Will tangible progress, of course, is sort of love is in the eye of the beholder, but ultimately tangible progress uh, is something that uh, one defines differently. But uh, as you would define it, do you think you will see it this week uh, out of Vienna? Yes or no? Um, Victor, one of the other stories that won't go away uh, and the markets are sort of still trying to figure out how important it is, but the latest is the China a position vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines in the South China Sea. We have U.S. Navy and Chinese Navy crisscrossing disputed waters in, in that ter area. This is a sort of constant now. What is the view from China on that? Does it feel like a big story? Is it a distraction? What do you think? Well, it's kind of, uh, you, can, you can call it kind of distraction well. And we believe, well, all this behind all these conflicts, well, 
well, stands the United States, well, mostly the United States, well, and just not long ago, it made it clear that it would not become the world's number two. So this means when well, it plans to invest a lot in infrastructure construction to compete with China and in other sectors too, but China is not competing with any countries when it's doing the infrastructure construction or living well, improving the living standard or anything else. It's not in competition with anyone else. Well, it's just trying to do what it should do for the people, for the government, for the country. And so this is kind of misunderstanding. And say like the Philippines, when Japan and some other countries were increasing conflicts with China recently, well, and not long ago, China, well, well, accused, I mean, blamed the Japanese, blamed Japan for being slavishly, uh, listen, well, being like a very slavish well, before the United States, well, and being, well, betrayed is, well, promised to China being kind of, use very strong words for, I mean, against, well, Japan. And so we, we have seen this kind of increasing tensions between, well, China and some other countries, well, but it's kind of obstacle when the country is rising and some countries, well, particularly the United States, regards it as a threat to its hegemony. Yes. But yeah, but China is not doing this in competition for, against any, any country as well. So this is kind of misunderstanding, but well, well it, it's it's certainly something that's continuing and and one the more it goes on the, the potential for a mistake or some kind of a problem uh, does seem to grow but obviously we'll have to just keep watching it robin just to wrap up mm -hmm. the week ahead we are obviously tuesday we've had the down day or the up day then the down day now the kind of in between day where do you think this energy markets travels going forward and i'd particularly welcome your comment as to why did opec move to a three-month outlook rather than just a one month seen as they're meeting every month anyway well, I think on OPEC uh, first, Sean, look, I mean, there was, of course, at the start of the year, a three month uh, outlook and this 500,000 barrel a day idea that didn't uh, survive contact with reality. Uh, now they've got another three month plan. I think it makes sense, right? Um, the one month meetings allow for, for adjustments, but it's good for them to have a, 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 at least a kind of a medium term plan for where things ought to be going and a bit of guidance for the market. And I think the market responded positively to that because it saw this as some sign of confidence in in demand, even though OPEC's own figures were actually uh, downgrading demand. So, you know, there, there are some uh, uh, some kind of conflicting messages there. Yes. But I, I, th I think it's important to have some idea where you're trying to go, if, even if, uh, you know, the next month you may, may discover you're not quite getting there. Um, look, and, and I, but I think the OPEC side, obviously it's important, but I think the, the demand picture is, is more important. I think the few hundred thousand barrels a day, plus or minus, uh, is... Uh, you know, is 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 more noise really? That yeah. the key thing is really where is demand going? Because there's apparently 5.6 million barrels a day of demand to come back this year, according to OPEC. You know, if that's uh, 4.6 or 6.6, that's that's a huge difference, and more than anything, OPEC is likely to do. Let's get the survey result and give uh, Vatali the last word. Oh my God, 50-50 in this room. <laughs> I suppose that's a, a, ref a reflection of nobody has any idea. Um, Vitaly, your thoughts on how the, this OPEC agreement goes forward. Uh, ultimately, it's built between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Is there any reason, any cracks anywhere, do you think, or this is very solid and it's going to continue to hold? Well, for now, both uh, parties seem to be, I mean, the Saudis and the Russians uh, and the Saudis as the leaders uh, of OPEC. But I mean, all, all, all other participants, I think everyone within uh, this Vienna Alliance, OPEC Plus, everyone uh, seems to be uh, willing to uh, make small sacrifices for, for the greater good, so to say, for, for the market rebalancing. And uh, in terms of Saudi-Russian relationship, again, uh, there have been some difficult times, some good times, but for now, uh, the, 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 uh, this agreement uh, has survived the test, and I think it has good uh, prospects of continuing. 
on that on, the, on that point, uh, does I mean Russia Saudi is really quite a, a, a very in, in, important relationship in OPEC plus. But then on the Iran agreement, Russia is also quite important to Iran. Uh, what is Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the re rehabilitation of the talks in Vienna? Look, I mean. Uh... Russia's relations with Iran are, are, are very complex. They are not just about oil. Obviously, oil is, is a factor and uh, sort of extra Iranian volumes on the market uh, may not be in Russia's best interests, but uh, other factors are much more important. And I think Russia really uh, looks for ways to incorporate Iran back into, into global relations and uh, sort of to develop the economic relationships with, 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 the, with the Republic of Iran. And so in this sense, uh, I think Russia would be supportive of, of, of lifting the sanctions. Uh, on, on a separate note, what I wanted to uh, mention here please, is please. that the really big concern in Russia now is about geopolitics. Apparently, uh, that there's high probability of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine uh, escalating in, uh, during the spring. And uh, the fear is that we may have uh, a major war in Europe. I mean, I'm really talking about a major military conflict. That, that's, that's a huge concern in Russia at the moment. Between? Well, Ukraine apparently wants to uh, take back the territories of those republics that declared their independence. And uh, the fear is that Ukraine may start uh, the, the, the military action to which Russia would have to, to respond because uh, many Russian citizens, people who by now have received Russian citizenship in those uh, regions of Eastern Ukraine would be attacked. And, and that's, that's the big fear. And of course, the Americans are coming in in support uh, militarily uh, with the, 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 the Ukrainian side. Uh, and when you... Take all. Well, of these. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think that the the Europeans or the Americans are going to uh, go into this conflict uh, with military support. No, I, this is this is out because then we have a nuclear, global nuclear war. No, this is not going to happen. But uh, but they are providing. Uh, the U.S. is providing military equipment into the Ukrainian uh, government. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's extremely dangerous. I think people really, uh, they, they talk about relatively small issues and they forget that we can destroy the, the earth, the humankind. We have the power to destroy ourselves and this is extremely scary. Well, there are a few little fires burning uh, over the last year in multiple places. Uh, and as you say, one of them could, uh, could become something much greater. And uh, that's something that everybody needs to be alert to. Thank you, Vitaly, Vitaly, for your comments today and insights from Russia, Victor from China, Robin from Dubai. Thank you all for uh, your contributions and insights. And we look forward to catching up with everybody during the week, uh, every morning. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye.